looking at the me I want to be, the me that God has called me to be, today and over the next two Sundays, I want us to focus on what is under our skin, the real me under our skin, the authentic self that God has called us to be. As I thought about who it is that God has called each one of us to be, I thought about a children's book that many of you have probably read. Y'all have doubtlessly heard that Richard and I became first-time grandparents on October the 1st. And as we look at little Joe and hold him and think about the life that is ahead of him, it causes me to reflect on the type of person that he will grow up to be and the influences around him in his life and what kind of influence I will be as a grandmother in his life. I was looking through some of the old books that I used to read to our daughter Michelle and that I read as a child. And one of those books that caught my eye is a book that was written by Marjorie Williams back in 1922 entitled The Velveteen Rabbit. Doubtless many of you have read that book. It's a children's book that in many ways is similar to the popular movies that some of the rest of you may be more familiar with called A Toy Story. But The Velveteen Rabbit, even though it's a children's story, it has a very deep meaning for those of us who are adults. See, in this story, this little boy has a velveteen rabbit toy. Amongst all the other toys in his playroom, he loves this velveteen rabbit. And in the course of loving that rabbit, because the rabbit is so loved by its owner, the rabbit becomes real. And over the course of time, the rabbit develops a self-consciousness about being in the world. Now, of course, the word real in the story is with a capital R, indicating to those of us who are adults that this is a metaphor, a metaphor for what it means for us to be our authentic self in the world to be true to the people that God wants us to be and created us to be. Well, at one point in the story, the velveteen rabbit has a conversation with the old skin horse. Now, the skin horse is another toy, a toy that has lived the longest in this little boy's playroom. The skin horse has outlived all of the mechanical and shiny toys that have come and gone in the playroom. The skin horse itself has been well loved by this little boy and other children who have lived in that household. Loved so much that its brown fur has disappeared and there are bald patches on the horse. Bald patches so that you can see the seams where the horse has been sewn together. And the hair in the horse's tail is very thin. Much of the hair has fallen out and has been used to string beads for little girls who have lived in that playroom. But the skin horse has the gift of wisdom having lived all this time in that playroom. And so one day, the velveteen rabbit asked the skin horse this question. The velveteen rabbit asked, Do you become real all at once or bit by bit? 
And the skin horse replies, it doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges and have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been rubbed out and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and you look very shabby. Does it hurt, the rabbit asks? Sometimes, the skin horse says, but you don't mind. Because when you're real, it doesn't matter that it hurts. And it doesn't matter how you look. Because when you're real, you can't be ugly except to those who don't understand. My friends, that's a very powerful statement to me. It's a very powerful statement because we become real when we are loved by God. When we open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receiving that love and knowing that we are loved, no matter what we look like, no matter how much we hurt, no matter how much we have hurt others, we can become real. We become um, our authentic selves. We can be who we are without pretense. We don't have to put on a false facade. We can be comfortable in our own skin, as the saying goes. And the process of becoming real, as the skin horse says, happens bit by bit, not all at once. It takes time for us to grow into our authentic self. And in the Wesleyan tradition, we call this sanctification. Becoming more and more like Christ. Becoming more and more like the people that we are called to be. And it happens in those day-to-day -day choices that we make. For I become more aware every day that the person I am today is in large part due to the choices and decisions that I made in the past. And it becomes frighteningly aware to me that the person I will be this time next year, let alone five years, ten years, fifteen years from now, is based in large part on the decisions that I make today and tomorrow and the next day. God has given us this beautiful gift of free will and the choices that we make determine the character that is being developed inside of us and the life that we live and the way we touch other people in our lives. Peter Gomes says in his book, The Good Life, and I quote, The success of every culture hinges not on the big points of morality, but on the smaller ones, like being considerate of others and pulling your own weight. These values are not legally enforceable nor purely private but they constitute the connective tissue of people interacting in a healthy society. A friend of mine and I were discussing that quote recently, and she said, you know, it's as if we are all Christians under construction. We are not all that we can be yet. We can be better and better and we can grow more and more like Christ every day as we make those decisions and those choices each day to nurture those seeds of the fruit of the Spirit that God has placed within us. 
the fruit of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul talks about in the scripture passage we read today from Galatians chapter 5, becoming more and more like Christ, bearing that fruit that Jesus calls us to bear. For Jesus said we are appointed to bear fruit. So I want to talk about the first three of those fruits today. And then next week I'll talk about three more. And the following week I'll talk about the final three of these nine fruits of the Spirit. The list that Paul gives to us, if you have your Bibles and you want to look at it, I invite you to do so. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22. But the very first fruit that he talks about is love. Love. Love is the primary fruit of the Spirit. And in a sense, all of the other fruits are born out of this one fruit, love. For Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that others will know we are his disciples by the way we love one another. In the epistle of James, love is called the royal law. The royal law of love is what we are called to live by. And the Greek word that is used here is the word agape. And I know that many of you are already well aware that in the Greek there are multiple words for our one English word, love. But the word agape that is used here is very important. It is not a physical love or romantic love. It is not even really a feeling as much as it is an action, a decision to do the loving thing whether we feel like it or not. A decision to do the loving thing to others whether they deserve it or not. A, a decision to take actions of love whether people return that love to us or not. It's a determination to be more like Christ, to display love to the world. As many of us participated yesterday in the Pride Festival here in Columbia, we had at the Washington Street booth two poster boards on either side of our table asking people who are among the LGBTQ community, what did other Christians say or do when they found out who you really are? My friends, when I read the comments that people wrote on that poster board that we had there, there were comments that broke my heart of people who have been harmed and hurt, people who have been treated as if they are not people. But there were also comments there that warmed my heart, comments of saying, you are loved comments that spoke of acceptance and understanding. Agape love. Loving everyone, seeing the image of God in everyone, is what we are called to do. In the Bible, the word agape is used 116 times is the primary virtue of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Loving one another. Loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And being able to love ourselves. 
And agape is doing the loving action regardless of how we feel inside. It's making a determination to love. When Jesus told us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us, the word that Jesus used there is agape. Agape your enemies. Do the loving action towards your enemies even though they don't deserve it. Do the loving action towards your enemies even though they didn't return that action toward you. Now think about it. If each one of us did the loving action regardless of how we felt, what kind of difference would that make in the world in which we live? It's the primary virtue of the Christian faith. So think about what it would do to our marriages if we did the loving act even when we don't feel it. Think about what it would do to our relationship with our parents, with our children and our grandchildren. Think about what it would do in our relationships with our coworkers, our bosses, our employees, our classmates. If we did the loving action always, it would make a big difference in this world. I want to share with you a picture of what it looks like a picture that comes from a story that Tom Toole told to his congregation at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York. He told about a wedding that he once conducted. He said he was requested to perform this wedding not at the church but at a family's farm because the mother of the bride was suffering from dementia from advanced Alzheimer's disease. She was barely conscious. She never responded with words, only with moans and with groans, which she did a lot. But it was very important to the bride that her mother be present for her wedding. So the couple wanted to be married at the family farm where the mother was comfortable and where if she moaned and groaned too much, the bride's father could escort the mother out of the gathering area to a quiet place. Tool agreed to perform this wedding, and when he arrived at the farm, he said he saw a big front porch on the front of the house. The house was beautifully decorated and there were ornate white rocking chairs all across the front porch. And the members of the bridal party were seated there in those rocking chairs. They were graduates of prestigious universities like Harvard and Stanford, Duke and Dartmouth. And as they sat there in those rocking chairs, he imagined that they all had degrees like MBAs and law degrees. They looked bright, they looked beautiful, they were young. And he said this interesting comment, he said, they had the misfortune of knowing that they were bright and young. Yeah. When Tool checked on the bride just 30 minutes before the ceremony was to begin, she asked, is it okay if my father takes my mother in early and places her in the front row? And I promise if mama ends up making too many noises to disrupt the service, dad will just gently escort her out. Tool said, well, of course, that'll be fine. Well, the hour arrived for the wedding to begin. And the father literally had to carry his wife in like you carry a small child. He walked her down the aisle up to the front pew and he sat down in the pew and he held her like you would hold a child. The wedding party came in and they came in with all the confidence of young, educated, well-positioned 
persons. And they stood at the altar as Tool began the service. And Tool says this is what happened. He said he spoke those words that we have all heard at weddings. He said he asked the bride and the groom to repeat after him, I, Andrew, take you, Melissa, to be my wedded wife, and I promise before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, for as long as we both shall live. And that's when it happened, Tool said. God's Spirit penetrated those groomsmen as they heard those words. They heard those words for the first first time in all their fullness, and you could see it just wash over their faces as they understood the impact of those familiar words. They realized in that moment that as assured as they were in being bright and beautiful people with a future before them, that no matter how much money or power or prestige they realized in their lives, their life would never be fully complete without this gift of love. And they realized that despite power and money and prestige, that none of us are guaranteed a beautiful and bright future. That things go wrong in this world. Things happen. You see, 35 years earlier, the father of the bride and his wife the wife that was now cradled in his arms and could only moan and groan had said those same vows to one another. And everyone in the wedding party understood that. They looked at that husband cradling his wife, a wife who couldn't even respond when he told her that he loved her. And tears welled up in their eyes as they realized that life doesn't always come out the way we plan it. You can run into problems you never dreamed of running into. That husband, in the eyes of all the people gathered there that day, had earned a Ph.D. in loving. Knowing what it means to choose to love, he cared for his wife even when she couldn't respond. Now it's easy in some senses for us to love people that we have chosen to be close to in life, but we are called to love even the stranger. We are called to love those who we might consider enemies in this world. And that really does take an intentional choice. For us to nurture that seed of love that we have received from the Holy Spirit in our lives. I was reminded recently about Louis Armstrong's song, What a Wonderful World. A few Sundays ago, I preached a sermon with that title and someone asked me why I never mentioned Louis Armstrong's song. I do love that song. But do you know that Louis Armstrong was criticized by many for that song? That song came out in 1967, and in 1968, he received much criticism for that song. If you recall, Martin Luther King had been assassinated Vietnam was going on. There was a lot of racial unrest. It seemed as if our world was falling apart. A lot of anger and unrest was going on in the world. And in the midst of all that evil that was taking place, people criticized Louis Armstrong 
for such a soft song saying that it was a wonderful world. What kind of wonderful world is this with all of this evil going on? And Louis Armstrong in 1970 released a recording in which he gave an introduction to the song and he said these words, People are asking me, hey, Pops, what do you mean, what a wonderful world? Well, it seems to me it ain't the world that's so bad. It's what we're doing to it. Love, baby, love. That's the secret. If a lot more of us would love each other, we'd solve a lot of the world's problems." End quote. Love, baby, love. That's the secret. Agape love. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, growing more and more loving in this world. We can't change the other people around us. But we can choose to do the loving thing, no matter how it feels. The second fruit of the Spirit that Paul lists for us is joy. And it's interesting that just like love, joy is not necessarily a feeling. It's a choice. Happiness is based on our circumstances. Happiness is a feeling that comes based on good circumstances. But joy is a choice. Joy is a choice. A choice that comes from the confidence knowing that God can transform whatever situation we find ourselves in. Knowing that God can transform situations. Like the Apostle Paul saying, I have learned to be content in all the circumstances of life. Real joy is seeing the world in a way of lenses of hope. Hope that no matter what the circumstances are, we can focus on the things that we are grateful for. Which is the real value of that Thanksgiving tree here at the church. Helping us to reclaim joy so that nothing robs us of the joy in our life. Choosing to focus on what we're grateful for instead of what we're disappointed by in this world is a choice that we are called to make. You see, every day when we wake up, we have that choice. We can start our day off by thinking about the things about our spouse that frustrate us and disappoint us, or we can start our day off by thinking about the things in our spouse that we are thankful for. We can start our day off thinking about the things that we dread about our job, or we can start our day off thinking about the things that we are thankful for in our place of work and the things that we are called to do that day. We can start our day off thinking about the negative or thinking about the positive in this world. There's a story that I read about an Irish tenor by the name of Ronan Tynan. Ronan Tynan had both of his legs amputated after a motorcycle accident. Now think about what your reaction would be if you had to have both of your legs amputated. Think about how you would feel and how your outlook on life would change. Well, let me tell you how he responded. He went on to become a medical doctor. He continued to sing as a well-respected Irish tenor and he became an excellent athlete. In 1984 and in 1988, he participated in the Paralympics, and he won four gold medals for discus, shot put, and long jump. He even rode show horses and became a great, great equestrian master. He had to have a special set of artificial legs made that were long enough so that he could ride the horses. 
And a reporter once asked Tynan, how tall are you really? Now think about that for a minute. He's had both legs amputated. How tall are you really? And I love his response. Tynan replied, I'm adjustable. Isn't that great? He didn't let his circumstances rob him of his joy. We are all called to be adjustable to the situations that happen in our life, to the circumstances that happen. Don't let the circumstances of your life rob you of your joy. We had a senior pastor at Trenton Road United Methodist Church who used to end his sermons with the same benediction just about every single Sunday. And he would say, don't let anything rob you of your joy. Joy is a choice that we make. In spite of his physical challenges, Tynan chose joy. And he is a living testimony to the truth that what happens on the outside of us does not have to affect what we feel on the inside of us. What happens on the outside is not nearly as important as what's going on under our skin. My dear friends, we are called to nurture those gifts of love and joy, and we are called to nurture the gift of peace. Peace is actually related to the Hebrew word shalom, and shalom is more than a physical peace, is more than an absence of conflict and war in this world. Shalom is a wholeness, a oneness of body, mind, and spirit. Is a wholeness on every level of our being. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled. That's the peace that the Apostle Paul knew when he said in Philippians, Don't worry about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will fill your hearts and your minds. This fruit of peace comes from thankfulness in our hearts. Thankfulness for what we do have. And it's a peace that God will give to us when we ask for it by prayer and supplication. Here's how one man describes receiving that peace. He says there once was a very difficult time in his life. He had received a ring that was given to him by his mother before she died. And it was one of his most treasured possessions. But suddenly and unhappily, he lost the ring and he searched and searched and searched for it for days. It was a treasure that his mom wanted him to have and it was a piece of her that he held on to as priceless. So it broke his heart that he had lost it, and he was almost inconsolable. He talked to his sister about it, and she wept as well. They cried bitterly over this lost ring. Several weeks later, this devout young man suddenly stopped crying, and he stepped aside to pray. His sister didn't have that kind of faith. She didn't think prayer was worth anything at all. She laughingly said to her brother, what's the good of praying about a ring? It won't bring the ring back. And the young man said this. He said, no sister, probably not. But let me tell you what praying has done for me. Praying has done for me what finding the ring could not do. It has made me quit willing. It has made me quit willing that I find the ring. And instead, it's made me willing to accept that I may never find it. And that's almost as good as finding it, isn't it? To let go of that desire and that search and that emptiness and that loss and instead to just be filled with a peace that it's okay that I may never find it. Peace. Peace born of faith like that quietens our spirit. 
It allows us to pass that peace on to others and to let go of worry and strife. These positive characteristics that Paul describes are gifts that God gives to us, but we need to choose to nurture them and to grow in them. Somehow, sadly, we often forget that. Even when we're in the church all the time. And so as we prepare now to pray, I'm going to begin with just a few moments of silence and allow you to ask God to nurture those gifts of love and joy and peace in your hearts. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, send your Spirit into our hearts that we might be open to growing more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us to choose love, to choose joy, and to receive peace. For it is in Jesus' holy name that we offer this prayer, even as we pray the prayer that His Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.